Our nation, uh, over the last uh, few weeks, has been uh, gripped by this concept of revival. There's been several people talk about it. I'm sure that you've heard about it. Revival, 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 revival. Lord has allowed us, we've spent uh, like four weeks talking about revival. And guess what? We're not stopping today. And it just so happens we're in the part of Jonah where God has created a giant revival that is happening in the nation of Nineveh. What you may not be aware of is that this revival is not just happening here, but all over the world. In Mexico, there are thousands giving their heart to Jesus every single night. In Nicaragua, the same. God is moving. God is in the midst of of, of, of moving. And we often pray for revival of the nations and the revival of of, of God's people. And and I know you guys are going to be sick and tired of hearing me say this by the end of this series, but how often are we willing to acknowledge that it takes us to make it happen? I'm going to go ahead and spoil the last sermon of this uh, sermon series. I already spoiled it for the youth this morning. Uh, but here in about four weeks, you're going to hear the end of, jo- of Jonah, and we're going to uh, get to where the fact, the realization is that God has called each of us to a Nineveh. Where is yours? Every single one of us has been called to a Nineveh, but so often we're more like Jonah, and we're running as far and as fast away as we can. Today, we come to this passage of Scripture the, the miracle of the great fish or whale, if you, if you will. Uh, we have this idea that this was a great miracle. The precision and, and the intricacies of, of just this, this fish or whale being large enough or able enough to find Jonah in the midst of the sea, which if any of you have ever been on the sea, know is, it's relatively large. Um, you know, water covers most of our planet. The intricacies of all that. And we think that's a great miracle. But today I submit to you what's happening in Nineveh is an even greater one. What's happening in Nineveh that we're going to get to today is an even greater miracle. God did a greater miracle. He used somebody who disobeyed God, who tried to run as far from from God to proclaim a simple word. And suddenly the unthinkable happens. An entire nation repents and turns to God. From the greatest of these to the least of these. Today we're going to talk about a passage of scripture and find the spirit of revival or the heart of revival. It's not man-made, it's not man-proclaimed, but it is by God. There have been several periods of history where God has used man to, to bring forth revival and his calling people to repentance. But just as he uses Jonah here, the question then comes, and the question has stayed the same pretty much through this whole, whole chat or, or whole book. Are we willing to be used like Jonah? If you have your Bibles, open with me to Jonah chapter three. Jonah chapter three, and we're going to begin reading in verse six. Jonah chapter three, verse six. I'd ask if you have found it and you are able to this morning, would you stand with me? In the honor of reading of God's word, Jonah chapter 3, verse 6. God's word says, The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, and covered himself with sackcloth, and, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd, or flock taste anything. Let them not be fed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil ways and let the violence that is in, uh, from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn his fierce anger so we may not perish. And when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them. And he did not do it. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for today. 
Lord, I pray that, Father, right now, God, immediately, Lord, would you prepare our hearts and our minds for what you have for us today? Take me, hide me behind the cross. Lord, it has nothing to do with me. But God, today, as we look at what the spirit of revival is, God, would you instill that in us? Would you show us what your plans are for that? And God, would you move in a way that only you can? God, I pray that, Father, you would just speak today, that we might hear from you, and that we might be sent for you. So, Father, we love you. We thank you. We pray all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. There have been significant periods in history where we have experienced uh, great revivals. The first great awakening heralded by uh, many men, but uh, particularly uh, attributed to Jonathan Edwards and his preaching in the Puritans in the the 1730s. The second great awakening in the 1790s, sweeping through Kentucky, Indiana, Tennessee, Ohio, uh, which were circuit riders. They were preachers that would just ride on horseback and go around and they would proclaim the word and they would call people to repentance and golly, it worked. The third great awakening, which is known as the the lay awakening, because God used laymen to spread it in the 1850s. The fourth great awakening in the 1960s, heralded on by the hippie movement and and everything else, this desire to reach a new generation. Each of these began with prayer. Each of these began with a man that was burdened or men that were burdened by the fact that God had a plan and a proclamation and they saw a sinful world. Jonathan Edwards, he, he, he has such a bad rap of being the angry preacher guy. But if you look, Jonathan Edwards loved his people more than anything. He loved them enough that when he saw them degrading themselves in sin, he, he, he reproved them using Scripture. It wasn't an attack, it was a reproof, but we have labeled it as hate speech. <sighs> There were significant movements, but today I want to focus on the third one because it was known as the lay people movement. You see, while we had great names, you know, Charles Spurgeon, Dwight Moody, uh, D.L. Moody, uh, Hudson Taylor, we had all these great names that come out of the third great revival. The majority of the heroes of the third great revival were not named. They were nobodies. They pastored churches smaller than this. They were faithful week in and week out to, to, to go and till their farms. Most of them weren't paid. And God used them in a mighty, mighty way. There were accounts of, of small churches that could scarcely fit 50 bursting at capacity and a line to get in to experience Jesus. Can you imagine if we got to to Licking River this morning, there was a line of people just excited to experience Jesus this morning. What about that? Uh, George Whitfield would say in regards to this, uh, to those that he, he desired revival, he said, the renewal of our natures is a work of great importance. It is not to be done in a day, for we have not new houses to build up, but old ones to pull down. Revival is not a one-day task. God must break the hardened heart, but we must be there and willing to build the new house. I love that passage. Revival was not built in a day. You see, what's happened in Ashbury, what's happened in all this, it's, it's over. But it's not over. Because you hear, you still see, people are still hungry. People are still seeking. People are still gathering in colleges all across America, worshiping Jesus. Revival is not a one-day thing. Revival is not a two-day thing. And contrary to what Southern Baptist, uh, revival is not a five-day thing. You know how we put on a five-day revival, you know, we call it whatever. Revival is not that. Revival is not determined or declared by what man has created. God builds revival. And then we must be ready. We must be ready when that heart is broken. Look with me in Jonah. The word reached the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne. He removed his robe and he covered himself with sackcloth and ashes. Now, I know we are far removed from this time period. We read stuff like this and think, man, this guy's a nutter. 
He's covering himself in basically burlap, and, he, and he's sitting in, in ash. And we think, man, that's crazy. But this wasn't that uncommon. This was a sign of mourning. This was a sign of, of repentance. There were so many. We have different perspective on how the king reacted, but the last five verses were how the people reacted. We saw the people mourning, putting on sackcloth and fasting. We saw how the king reacted. He put out the decree that everyone who's already fasting should fast and they, they, everyone should turn from their evil ways. Jonah was faithful to proclaim the word that was, was given to him and understand that this word was not a happy word. Remember what Jonah said to them? Uh, he, let's go back here. And he said, and the people, uh, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown or destroyed, depending on what your, uh, your translation may say. But here, here's the point. Um, listen, the Assyrians were more like, ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. You've ever friend like that? You, you could not tell them what to do. That when, when, when God called Jonah to Nineveh, listen, it wasn't just a uh, coincidence that Jonah didn't want to go. Nobody wanted to go to Nineveh, especially to call out against it because Nineveh was brutal. Nineveh was known for, 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 for killing people who were against what they were about. And so Jonah going in this, calling against their destruction, listen, this was not like, oh, you need to forgive. Jonah was called to call Nineveh to repent. And God did the rest. God prepared the hearts. Because guess what would have happened? If Jonah, if Jonah had walked in there, and this is, this is a timing of God thing, by the way, because God had to prepare him. Imagine if Jonah had lived like 100 years before and Jonah had gone in and just decided, well, you know what, today I'm just going to tell everybody about God. He'd been a boom. They'd have killed him faster than I don't even know. They'd have killed him. But God had already done the work. God had already softened the hearts. This message went from the least of these to the greatest of these. They, they, they proclaimed them, and this king is put himself in sackcloth. He called them. God called to them to rescue them. Hear that this morning. God didn't call Nineveh to chastise them. God didn't call Nineveh. He called them to rescue them. Now, granted, things are going to change here in about 150 years, but God had called him to rescue him. God cannot ignore sin. We talked about that this morning. You know, society today, we like to pick and choose the characteristics of God that we like. We love the loving God. The righteousness of God, not so much. But we love the loving God, so we're going to talk about Him. The problem is, is if you begin to take, it's like Jenga, if you begin to take characteristics of God out, He's no longer God. And that whole Jenga tower just falls over. God called to Nineveh to rescue Nineveh. First thing I want you to see out of this passage is that revival demands repentance. Revival cannot happen without repentance. God called Nineveh not to, not, not to uh, be better. He, he called them to repent. He called them to turn. He called them to stop. To repent. And that's what we see here. Even the king is like Job. He sits himself in ash. And, he, and it's a sign of repentance. And he puts on this sackcloth. And this imagery that we get from the Old Testament is one of repentance. It's one of mourning. It wasn't just the weird guy that just decided that maybe burlap felt good. and just decided. No, it was that the king genuinely, genuinely was repentant. The people of Nineveh were genuinely repentant. Revival demands repentance. Verse 7, he says, He issued a proclamation and he published it through Nineveh by the decree of the king and the nobles. Let neither man nor beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Listen to this. Listen to what, jo what, 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 what Jonah is recording here. Listen to what God is doing here. This king is calling out and he's telling nobody, even your animals are not to eat or drink. And not only that, I want you to put them in burlap. I want you to put them in sackcloth. Verse 8, 
Y'all know my mind's funny. I don't, I, I don't have to explain the fact that sometimes my mind just... But I just picture trying to put this sackcloth on a cow, okay? It, 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 <laughs> I, I told you, my mind's a little funny. But the king would make this decree. You see, we are never told that people had faith in Jonah. Because honestly, Jonah really didn't have anything important to say. He was used by God, using God's words to call out. We often times put ourselves in the midst. Salvation is not about you. You have no part in it. God did it. it we, we, could not, we could not earn it ourselves. We could not do it ourselves. Jesus did it. Jesus paid that cross. Pays that down on the cross. And it's because of that that we have repentance. We have revival that happens. I love is this king is he's calling out, he's telling all these things. But we need to remember, even in Jonah's case, that faith should never rest with the messenger. We're the messenger. People could have faith in us all we want. Guess what? I'm going to let people down. I'm going to let people down left and right. You know Why? I'm human. Our faith should never be in the messenger. It should be the one who gave the message. It should be in God. What I love about this is, is Jonah didn't say, this is a pastor's dream, by the way. I, I wished that I could walk in here to downtown Sayersville and declare out to Sayersville, repent. The, the kingdom of the Lord is at hand or repent. In 30 days, you'll be overthrown or destroyed or whatever. And thousands of people would just come to be repentant. No, that's, that's not going to happen. But if God said it, it's good. It had nothing to do with clay. God's message is always a message that will cut through compromise. There are three things that we can see in the Assyrian's response to this. If you'll flip back to, to the first five verses. In, in, in verse five, the, the people of Nineveh called, believed... In God. They had faith. They believed in God. They had faith in God. It took one Jonah to get right with the Lord for an entire nation to repent. God used one man. Now, listen. Imagine if every single church we had in America, every single one of them, decided to leave today. And to tell one person about Jesus. We would see revival. We, we, would, we, would, we wouldn't even know what to do. We'd have to build more churches. Oh gosh. There are five churches... Five Southern Baptist churches uh, that close every month in America. Five. That may not seem like a huge number. Five a, a month. People believed in God. They had faith in God. Look at the New Testament. It took a woman going to Jacob's well, Sychar, and, and being offered living water. And, 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 and going apart from there, hearing all the sins that she's ever done, to go out and to bring an entire city of Sychar to Jesus. Faith goes a long way. Second thing I want you to see is the people fasted in verse 5. They, 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 they fasted. I wish we did this more often. Often in Scripture, you see people mixing prayer with, with fasting. The Syrians here are no different. The king says, let everyone turn from their evil ways at the end. I'm kind of jumping ahead here. But the, the word here is shovabet. 
It's the Hebrew word shovabet. And it means to go in a completely different direction. And, and what I want you to hear is, is, is it comes from this root word that we use for repent, which is uh, tishova. The imagery here is complete. Revival cannot happen without repentance. The second thing I want you to see out of this passage is this. It says in verse 9, who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. We may not perish. Second thing I want you to see is that revival is impossible without forgiveness. It's not. If there was not forgiveness and grace through Jesus Christ, what is the point? Revival cannot happen without forgiveness. It focuses, notices every, every part of revival so far has pointed back to God. It has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with God. Are you, are you willing to be used by that God? See, the people of Nineveh were placing themselves on, on God's mercy. They looked not to Jonah, but to the one who had sent Jonah. And what I love, I'm, I'm excited for chapter 4, because Jonah throws what I think is the biggest temper tantrum in the Bible. It's great. Hmm. We could only be offered salvation because of the forgiveness through grace alone. I mentioned this passage in, in, earlier, but in John chapter 4, we have a beautiful account of Jesus at the well of Jacob. And, and, and you know the story. It, it comes with a lot. Jesus is, is come. He's sitting at a well, and this woman comes in the heat of the day when everybody else would have been home. There are a lot of speculations as to why, but... Uh, he asked her for water and say, who are you, sir, that you should talk to me for you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan? The two would have never conversed, especially not in that way. But then things change just a little bit. Jesus continues and uh, they talk about it and she, he's confronted with her and he tells her, she says, go and bring your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. He says, you're right. You've got five of them. And the one you're with now is not your husband. Now, we love to take that. We love to bash this woman. We love to, to, to say, oh man, this, this woman, the harlot, whatever you want to call her. But watch what happens. Jesus begins to talk to her. And he offers her, he says, you drink from this water, you're going to get thirsty again. But I can offer you a water in which you will never thirst again. She says, sir, give me that water. And he departs. He offers her forgiveness and no one else. Okay, he says, depart and sin no more. And you want to know what happens during that account? Verse, verse 429, uh, John chapter 4, verse 29 says this. Watch what happens. He, the woman goes into Sychar and she proclaims out, Come, see the man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? See, the thing about Jesus, the thing about forgiveness, the thing about grace is it's contagious. When you meet somebody who was recently saved, buddy, they want to tell everybody. Why do we lose that? Why do we lose that fervor? Why do we lose that fire? Why are we less excited about the fact that we were wretched sinners dying and going to hell and the fact that Jesus Christ snatched us out of this and we came barreling out of that grave oh what a glorious day why on earth do we lose that fire but we do but we do grace is contagious and when you begin talking about god's grace when you begin talking about that this woman who, who was offered this grace, she's she's got six men in her life she's just living this life that i'm sure the the reason probably she came to the midday was because people were probably talking about her and that's all speculation we don't know but this woman had to have a reason for coming in the middle of the day when it was you know what else and jesus offered her living water Jesus offered her forgiveness. Jesus offered her more than that. And you know what's incredible? Is she goes and she tells people, look at this. Look what he's doing. Let 
Why would you hold on to the cure like a treasure? And I know I'm going to be harping on this. I know that you're probably going to get sick and tired of hearing me. But if God can use one person to take the entire nation of Nineveh and pull it to repentance, what can God do through Licking River Baptist Church if we all were faithful? What could he do? What could he do for McGoffin County if all who proclaimed Jesus were faithful? What could he do? Are we willing to be obedient? The last thing I want you to see comes out of uh, chapter 10. It says, when God saw this, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. When God saw their repentance, he relented of his wrath. You see, it was not Jonah who averted the wrath. It, it was not really the Assyrians. It was the, 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 the God relented. The wrath. Last thing I want you to see is revival is spurred by willingness. Revival is spurred by willingness. The people were willing to repent. They were willing to turn. They were willing to stop the evil. They were willing to stop their pagan sacrifices. They were willing to stop their murdering. They were willing to stop the raping. They were willing to stop all the things that Nineveh was doing that was an abomination to God. They were willing to stop it and they were seeking to turn to God. And God relented of the disaster. The truth is, and this may sting a little bit because it stings me. It stung me as I wrote it. If you wish to see revival, if you want to see revival, you must be willing to be used. If we desperately pray and long for revival, we desperately must long to be used for it. Here's the truth. Do you know statistically, statistically, I, I, I could say this because Keith's not here. Steve and, and Bobby, y'all just don't listen. Um, statistically, your pastor is not the person that saves the most souls in any church. Doesn't matter if, listen, I, I, I could be the greatest orator in the world. I could stand up here, and guess what? I couldn't, I, it'd be like I was speaking French. Statistically, the pastor is not the most evangelistic person in the church. You know what your friends, your family, your, your, your people respond to? You. I'll prove you an example. You ever, you ever said something to somebody until you're blue in the face and they just refuse to listen and then somebody else says the exact same thing? If you, own te if you have a teenager, you've experienced this. Somebody else says the exact same thing. They're like, that's a good idea. The realization is that while I am evangelistic, I love people, I can't reach everybody. There are people that just won't listen to me, and that's okay. But they'll listen to you. You know what I have found is that when people find out I'm a pastor, there's usually a very quick transition. Uh, usually they stop cussing around me, and they start acting really awkward and weird. Because I'm just the religious man. And that wall just went... <laughs> I'm never talking to them. Because whatever I... They're never hearing what I say, I should say. I was talking... Last Monday, I had a chance to, to hear a whole bunch of pastors talking. And uh, something was said in this. Um, one of the largest growing churches in Kentucky... The, the, the pastor was asked, he, he said, what, they asked him, well, what are you doing? Why, why are you being most successful? You know, are, are you doing this evangelistic 
thing? Are you, you know, are you running this program? Are you, what, what, what are you doing? <laughs> he said this. Uh, they, they said this. He said, you must be a fantastic evangelist because, he, he, you know, he's putting up numbers. He said, actually, I'm my church's worst evangelist. He says, my people are the best because God uses them. Are we willing to be used Bible? And I think about this and the fact, listen, Charles Spurgeon, if you, hear, if you ever hear his salvation story, it's amazing because it was a man who couldn't even pronounce the names of the Bible correctly. He was just, he, he was just a layman who was, who was just preaching. He just opened the Bible. He just got up one day and decided the Lord laid a message on his heart, kind of like some of our old regulars do. And he was just, he couldn't even pronounce the, the words correctly. He's all over the place. He, he, you know, Copernicum. Is that a Capernaum? But God used him. And when, when Charles Spurgeon wandered into that Methodist church that day, just to get out of a snowstorm, he didn't even want to be at that church. He just wanted to be out of the snow. He heard this man stumble all over his words. Didn't make a whole lot of sense. But he heard these words. He said, look unto me. Speaking of Jesus. He realized that Jesus was the reason. When God saw what they did, how he turned from their evil way, God relented the disaster. and He wouldn't do it. We must ask ourselves if we are willing to be used by God. I'll end with this story. In the 19th, uh, 19th century, uh, there was an acrobat by the name of uh, Jean Franchot. Uh, he was known by the name of Bloden. Uh, uh, or, I'm sorry, Blondin, not Bloden. Uh, Blondin. His hair was blonde. So, of course, everyone called him Blondin. Um, but he was known for uh, walking across Niagara Falls on a tightrope. You know, you've seen crazy people do it. I don't understand why, but he was known for that. And so everyone associated in his mind uh, these crazy acrobatic stunts. Well, one occasion, uh, he pushed a wheelbarrow across Niagara Falls, and uh, he did all these crazy things. One, he actually uh, brought an omelet, and he paused midway over the falls to eat his omelet uh, while on the tightrope. But in the midst of this, he, he, he came across one day, and there was a crowd waiting for him at the other end. And he pointed to one of the men up front. And he said, sir, he says, do you, uh, do you have trust in my ability? And he says, yeah, I've watched you for years. You've done this. You know what you're doing. You, you're, you're really good at it. Well, then, sir, get on my back. We're going across. Not on your life. <laughs> See, there was a form of belief in the acrobatic. He's seen him do it a hundred times. He, got, he, he had faith that he could do it until it became personal. See, we come Sunday after Sunday and we have faith that God can do something like this until it becomes personal. Well, God, I'm not good enough. Well, God, you don't understand. People know about me. But God, you just, you, you just don't truly understand. No, God understands perfectly. And he's called you to do it. There's spiritual belief. <laughs> and then there's full commitment. The problem is we like Jesus as our secret pet. You know, we pull him out, we play with him every once in a while, we bring him to church on Sunday, we might dress it up in a good, you know, dress. But what about the rest of the week? If we want revival, we must be allowed, we must allow ourselves to God, we must allow ourselves to be used for God to bring it. Through his call to repentance, revival demands repentance. Through his forgiveness and through our willingness. Maybe you're here this morning. 
you've never put your faith and your trust in Jesus before. Can I encourage you that this morning, there's no better time. We talk about Jesus, we talk about God, we talk about all these things, but can I assure you of, of one thing? The fact that we are all sinners. And the fact that God loved us so much that despite our sin, He sent His Son Jesus into the world to pay the sacrificial sin debt that each of us owed. To hang on the cross in pain and agony, taking the sin upon the world upon Himself to say it is finished. And to offer it to you today. You hear me say it's a free gift, but it costs you everything. Because it becomes no longer about you, it becomes about Jesus. If you're here this morning and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ today, I want to invite you to do that. Maybe you're here this morning and you've been a Christian for several years. And you would just be honest with yourself and you just say, I'm just not where my life needs to be right now. Man, God had this plan, but if I'm honest, man, I'm closer to Tarshish than I am to Nineveh. This time's for you. You just say, God, here I am. Send me. Do, do something through me. God, I've, I've sinned. I'm, I, I'm coming back to you. This time's for you. Maybe you're here this morning, and if you're honest, you're just looking for a church home, and you're looking for a place that's going to plug you in to serve this community. Can I tell you this is going to be an awesome place? Maybe you're here today, and you're just be honest, and you would say, I think God's calling me to something. I don't know what it is. But maybe God's called me to serve Him in ministry. Maybe He's called me to serve in missions. Whatever it may be, this time's for you. Maybe you're here to say, you know, I, I was saved, I was I, I, all these things, but I never got baptized. This time's for you. During invitational, there are a ton of decisions to be made. And if we are faithful to listen to God, each of us has a decision to make this morning. Because we cannot come week after week and not leave radically transformed by the grace of Jesus. My encouragement is that during this time of invitation, we're going to sing Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. And where you are, and you could just be like, Lord, what do you want? What do you need? You could sing with us. This altar will be open. I'll be down front if you need prayer. But during, do not waste a time of invitation. Do not just assume that it's just something that, that, oh my gosh, did you see who went forward? Because trust me, they're paying attention to what God's speaking. They've got their own things to deal with. Father God, I thank you for today.